Hello everyone and welcome back to the Vintage Sewing Machine Garage. You are looking at a <laughs> recent uh, acquisition of mine and uh, this is a machine that I saw. I couldn't help myself. There was an auction, one of these online auctions that I went on to and I found this and it was Believe it or not, just a few doors down from where I live, I literally didn't even have to get into a car for several reasons. It was just a few houses down, and uh, that's where I ended up picking it up because I ended up making a bid and winning this Singer 301A. You'll see the A right here. Uh, and I thought I would share this with you guys to talk about not only the 301A, which I've talked about on a number of occasions in a number of videos, but to also talk about the experience of buying a machine, especially when you can't inspect it with the pandemic, you know, I, th there was no opportunity to inspect. And uh, I bid on this machine and won. And I think the reason for that is because, uh, you know, I don't want to pay a fortune for these machines. It's okay if you're going to keep the machine and use it. I, you know, I use whatever machine I have on hand. I usually have, right now I have about a half dozen machines somewhere in my, my, my stash here at home, uh, my, my workshop. And so um, I'm not picky about which machines I use. Uh, I love so many different brands. But anyway, when I saw this machine, I, I knew what it was. I said, oh, well, there's a 301 and it's, it's uh, on an auction. But what I could not tell at the time was this because of the way it was photographed it was photographed kind of funny kind of like this it's hard to describe but the photo was dark and and I knew um, that you know a Singer 301 should have a uh, extension like this one but uh, the 301 as those of you who know the machine will know can have an extension that comes to here right about here. And these um, were designed to fit into most Singer tables that had, uh, not this one, but again, right here with the um, 17 inch, I think I'm saying that right, 17 inch or 16 and a half, you guys help me. Uh, it's not coming to my mind right now. The, uh, the same dimension uh, of, of, of width for the footprint of a Singer sewing machine, the one with the, um, with the shorter extension, which comes to right about there, uh, it will fit in Singer sewing tables that can hold um, the uh, the Slantomatic machines, you know, the 400, the 500 series. And you will often see, um, you, right now you're looking, I'm actually just doing this on top of this treadle uh, table. You guys saw that in a recent video. And uh, anyway, uh, we'll, I'll make a different video about this this machine and and how it can fit or not into a singer table. I don't want to. I, I can see this video going way longer if I do that. So we'll we'll do a different video on that. Now, um, this particular Singer 301 came with a longer or wider extension, and it was not designed to go into uh, singer tables. Now I'll have to go back and do my homework to see if it will fit into a Singer card style table. I call them card tables. They're the large tables that have the openings, which are wonderful to have. Uh, they were made for the Singer Featherweight and I think the 301, but I can't remember. I'll have to go back. If you guys know, come behind me and, and uh, correct me, but I'm gonna make sure um, which of the 301 models, either the standard extension or the extra wide, which this is, uh, will fit. But pretty much, this was one of this was, of course, the 301 being a, um, it was created in sort of the model of the Singer Featherweight or the Singer 221. And I say that because like the 221, this has an aluminum chassis. It is relatively lightweight. I mean, it's not plastic, thankfully, but it's compared to a cast iron machine, it's, it was considered lightweight, right? And, and it had a handle. This handle's got a, some problems and issues here. Uh, I'm going to have to go underneath. I'll be going underneath the, uh, taking the lid off and there's a, there's a, there's some hardware underneath here and it looks like it's, uh, been used. Now this was, uh, there were, there was a surprise. There were some really, uh, pleasant surprise. When I went to pick the machine up, I saw, oh my gosh, it's the longer extension. 
And the thing I was really curious about, which again was not listed, and it was not shown in photos, and yeah, I kind of rolled the dice, but it has the thing that any of you who ever purchase a Singer Featherweight or a Singer 301, I'll zoom in here for you, you definitely want to see and check to see if it has the bobbin case. Now, I've talked about these bobbin cases before. The Singer Featherweight slash 301, because it works with both machines, that bobbin case is one of the most elaborate, magnificent bobbin cases ever engineered. And you can get reproductions. They're not bad. People buy them and use them. Uh, occasionally they have issues with them, but not always. They sell for $50 to $60 US. Now, the price of these original bobbin cases, which are often a preference for some people, um, because I suspect the, the production quality on these was, was even greater, even than those made in Japan today. I'm not sure why, um, but uh, if you want an original vintage uh, bobbin case, you're, you're going to be spending, uh, the prices keep climbing. We're into the high $80 figure plus shipping, which is shipping wouldn't be much. But you can see why you definitely want to know if the bobbin case is included. And I just took a chance. I said, well, here goes nothing. You know, I, I decided to do it and I'm glad I did because it's here. I have not removed the bobbin case because this machine, in case you haven't guessed from looking at its sad state, has been sitting a long time and um, it had a cover on it, a fabric cover, and it was in a basement. The whole machine was with the fabric cover on it. When I went into the basement to, to retrieve it, uh, to pick it up at the end of the auction, uh, the house didn't have a funky smell, but this machine uh, has, you'll see it's got some mildew. It's got, yeah, it's got dust. I'm, I'm not a stranger to seeing dust on old sewing machines, but this one, it, it was covered with a, with a pa uh, quilted fabric cover, and I think that must have held moisture to the machine. Thankfully, I don't see any oxidation or rust, which is always a concern. Um, now, when I... You know, just looking at the machine, I'm turning the hand wheel, it moves. Now it stops and I suspect it has to do with thread down below. It could be bobbin thread that's tangled up. Uh, I think I may have mentioned this before guys, Singer Featherweights and Singer 301s, uh, one of their, they have so many wonderful features and, and they're, these are some of the most popular vintage sewing machines that you'll come across and you'll, you'll discover that if you ever try to buy one and see the price. Uh, and they are notorious for being, uh, you will sometimes get thread jams and thread tangles. And I've shown in other videos, and I'll try to talk about it again with this machine, how to check from. It. It's not a, a bad thing, you can undo it. You just wanna know that it's something to look for because it can interfere with your machine. But once you've, you know, once you've pulled the threads out, then you're good to go. Um, it's, not a, it's, I don't, it's not an onerous problem, but it can happen over time and people don't know. Uh, what else to say about this machine other than that it is filthy. It is just one of the saddest looking 301s I've ever seen. Um, it has, still has its original glass lens, uh, which is what covers the, uh, the light bulb. It has what I ex think would be uh, this uh, button style foot pedal looks original to this machine. Uh, now the plug you know, it's not a rubber plug. It's one of the old Singer plugs. Uh, however, the the cord to this plug is really thick, thicker than the original. And I, I'm going to guess, maybe I'm wrong here, but I think this has been rewired at least once. Uh, and if you ever rewire <laughs> a Singer plug and you've got to do, uh, you know, this, this is the dual lead, right? This has the the cord to not only to plug in for power but also for the foot pedal and i've shown you guys the differences in another video getting all of this cord in here and putting it all back together without losing your mind can be difficult at times but uh whoever did this had the had a lot of patience um anyway uh this plug may be great and and of course it's beautifully made inside with brass i've got to check it out and decide what i'm going to do there uh, of course, I'll be taking the foot pedal apart, inspecting it, testing it, making sure it doesn't get hot, it doesn't hiss or crackle. Um, but anyway, there it is. And I think somewhere in here, I've seen, you know, someone has in the past 
They didn't even use electrical tape, which I don't use either. They put some masking tape here. It looks like the cord was damaged. It doesn't really look dry rotted, but uh, cords can get, you know, compromised and injured. Uh, I don't do tape, you guys know that. Uh, so we'll see about that. This is really the least of our concerns. Um, you guys take a look. <clears throat> this is a kind of like a little quiz for those of you who know this machine. There are things missing on this machine. Um, and I noticed them when I bid, but I bid anyway because it's a black 301. Black 301s bring higher prices than other colors. There's no performance reason for that to happen because they all are the same machine. But aesthetics matter to people, and I don't know if it's because it reminds them, uh, well, it doesn't look anything like a featherweight, but the featherweight is black. Whatever reason, black machines will typically bring a little bit more money when you go to look at the pricing on things like eBay. The other thing I've noticed is that the, the machines with the longer, the wider extension here, they also sell for slightly more. And this could, this could be not true in your market where you live, but I've noticed this. Um, uh, this is true. I've noticed this when I've priced machines in both the United States and Canada. This has been a trend. Now, uh, looking at the machine, this machine has very little of its decals left. There's some remnants. And I noticed this is not unusual to see paint loss on the edge of a machine because, you know, it's a vulnerable spot for chipping and so forth. But I noticed there's like a sort of a worn area all along the front here. And it looks from, from, it looks like the machine may have gotten a lot of use, but even that being the case, I still wanted it because I know <clears throat> the quality and the durability that these old machines had. Uh, can they theoretically have parts wear out? They can, it's not impossible, but it's very rare and I was willing to take a chance. So I asked you guys uh, watching this video, what's missing? Well, there are a couple things missing here. One of which is there's a thread guide missing and it normally would go here. That guide is for when you're going to wind a bobbin. Okay, and of course you're going to attach your bobbin, <clears throat> you attach your bobbin here. You have a thread, a uh, spool of thread that goes on a spool pin, which is also missing. Um, and so I would need those. Now you can sew with the machine, but you can't wind a bobbin without those pieces. <clears throat> and I'm gonna do a different video for you guys. We're gonna kind of go online and do a, do a search to find parts. <laughs> again, I knew this, I could tell that that was missing. Um, but I was, again, my, my biggest concern and question as to whether I was even gonna bid and how much I was gonna bid was based on that bobbin case. So happy to see that. Um, the dirt, the dust, even the mildew does not scare me, by the way, um, mildew does not really eat uh, metal. The reason the mildew is here is because there's dust. Mildew has to feed on something and it feeds on, you know, uh, uh, soil and dust that's in the air that settles on the machine. And when you add moisture in a place like a basement and you have a cover on it, that's why this happened. Uh, unlike things like wood, plaster, fabric, uh, once this is cleaned, um, there won't be uh, any smell. Now there is underneath here, oh, before I, before I move on, that look up here guys, this, there is a thread guide that, that attaches to the machine here, it's gone, and at first I thought maybe the, maybe the remnants of it were broken, but no, this is a nail. Someone took a, I don't know, a picture nail, and they bent it and did their best to, to, to replace this. I don't know what happened. I, who knows how many owners this machine had in its life. It has been sitting in a basement three houses down from where I live for a long time, uh, quite a long time. So anyway, uh, we're gonna I'm going to have to um, come up with uh, a source for this as well. I'm going to need that thread guide. Uh, let's take a look here on the back. We still have our thread guide here and we have our main thread spool pin. I really love the spool pins that came on the 300 series because they're they're like this big uh, flexible spring. Um, and I like them because they give. Uh, they're, they're much less likely to break off. This one's a little bent for whatever reason. And if I come down, you see there's even more crud. Now you still see some decals here. We'll talk about cleaning. Um, 
Let's see, what else? Uh, I have not plugged it in. Uh, I have not taken out the bobbin case yet because that bobbin case is very precious. And I'm going to guess that this machine has been sitting, it could be sitting 20 years or more. Bobbin cases, if you guys remember, are moving things. They are very complex. They don't look, they look simple, but they have springs and moving parts that have to slide. And they're, but they're delicate, right? They're like watches, like old school watches. And if I just take this bobbin case off, I just, you know, I can, this thing is flexing. This is the little piece that unlocks it. But if I start wrestling with that bobbin case, I could damage it and that would really make me cry. And you would cry too if you realized that you were the one who broke the bobbin case. It was your own machine. So uh, again, not surprised. Here's what well, we got cobwebs here. Oh, that's, there you go, right? It's just been sitting. It's been hibernating for a very long time. Let's see, if I open this side compartment, this is good. You wanna check these guys. These were made of aluminum and the hinges are small and you know, people make the mistake sometimes. Um, nothing in here. I see a few, few dust, dust bunnies, but nothing out of the ordinary. I'm not particularly worried about this area and section. Uh, it's a little interesting. I'm seeing green, something that looks green in there. That's odd. Um, uh, maybe it's just not something I've ever noticed before. Anyway, uh, people make the mistake when they get any sewing machine. They'll They'll be very careful because there's no grease in there. It's been sitting. Uh, they'll grab a machine like this. Never, ever grab your machine like this. If you do, you're going to stress it. It was not designed to be carried. Now, because this is an old handle, I'm not going to, I don't use the handles here on carrying cases or machines. You always want to pick it up here. Be very careful if you've had the light on. You got to let that cool or you're going to be in for a really unpleasant burn surprise. But when a machine is cool, you pick it up under its, you can pick it here, one here, one hand here, and then one hand underneath the machine. You want to brace it, okay? It's It's been around a long time. Don't, uh, you don't want to stress it. But people who grab them like this, mistakenly, it's a huge mistake because it really stresses the hinges on these doors. And um, the 500 series is especially vulnerable. A lot of times those doors, those beautifully shaped doors, they're gone or they're just in a pile because those tiny little aluminum or whatever the metal was used, I believe they were aluminum hinges. It's very soft and fragile. Okay, what else have we got here? If we have anything that has any smell, there is a very good chance that it is underneath. Now, before I open this up, oh, there was, that was my bobbin going rolling around. Uh, this is something else, doesn't surprise me. Uh, you will notice that these were the rubber feet Let's angle this down. You guys can see a little bit better. These were the rubber feet. Uh, and you'll see these two here. Well, this one's mostly gone. This one, and they've all kind of gone flat. You know, this one is crumbling. This one is kind of, th th there's a chemical um, change that happens over time in the rubber and it oxidizes. It gets really hard. And I will be taking this out and I can show you guys how to do that in another video. Uh, it's not hard and thankfully there are modern replacements for these. So again, no big deal, not a big cost. It's something to do, but eh, not, a, not a problem. Uh, let's see, this says patented Canada. So this machine would have been sold in Canada and I'm gonna take this, this uh, holding uh, nut off of here and Singer made it with texture so it's easy to grab a hold of now i suspect we're going to see something icky yep now look here guys this is something if you ever have a machine that smells funky this could be one of the reasons now this is a old felt pad and i anytime i have one of these i always replace the felt pad it's easy to do i think i've done a video on it um but it holds old oil sewing machine oil grease, dust, these are things that mold will grow on. Mold and mildew can't eat metal. In fact, metal doesn't absorb mold, but things like felt does. So this will all come off and get cleaned up and it will be just fine. I am not, uh, I am not, uh, uh, not worried about getting rid of it. Now, 
if you are, I, I have sensitivity to mold, many of you might also, so you want to be careful. Your nose will tell you. You want to do this in a well-ventilated area or even outside. I know we're in December right now. Um, so, you know, you have to use your own judgment here because anything that's molding can, can, can give you all kinds of, uh, uh, of unpleasant symptoms. So be careful. Um, and this is true of anything, not just, you know, sewing machine like this. But the good news is this thing is metal. And once I've cleaned this out and I've got new oil, new grease, the motor will be coming out, of course. Uh, this is one of the earlier of the motors that was used. And this same type of motor is not the same spec. It changed a little bit for the 400 Slantomatic and the 500 Rocketeer Slantomatics. And they kept using it, I think, even into the... Uh, to the touch and sews, which were still slant shank. But anyway, eventually they would do, uh, they would create these motors with bearings that were basically sealed that were not easy to get to down below. Uh, I think you can still get to the one up above. But this one has the little grease port. So the earlier ones had the grease port and then they eventually did away with that. But of course you see all this beautiful, glorious, high quality steel, you see the gears. Uh, but again, this is nothing unusual. Uh, the only thing that I'm really noticing that's odd or not common about this machine is the fact that it it looks like whoever owned it, and it could have been a series of owners, not necessarily one person, um, that this machine got used a lot. But that doesn't mean it's worn out, and it doesn't mean it will not sew beautifully again. So, beauty is only skin deep. <laughs> So I saw this machine. I think I was just one of two people that even bothered to bid on it. I suspect people saw it and thought, oh God, what a mess that is. And it is, it's gonna take a lot of work and time. Of course, I'll be disassembling the, the uh, tension assembly here to get it cleaned up and taken care of. But uh, we will do a video. I've had you guys ask me before about where you find parts. And I've got a number of different places I look, and some of you may have gone to the same spots, but I'm gonna to need to get this. I'm gonna to need to get this. Somehow, if you guys know where I can find a, a, either a vintage or reproduction of the spool pin, let me know, because I, so far I'm having a little tough time with that, but I'm patient with it. Um, and uh, we will bring this wonderful, magnificent example of a sewing machine, all new for 1951. And the last all-new model introduced by Singer in the color black. Um, but we will be working on this. And uh, I know uh, of all the, the, the people who subscribe to the channel, uh, a number of you are fans of the Singer 301. Singer had a, a number of great iconic machines, and this is one of them. But uh, anyway, we'll be going through and making videos uh, as, I, as I go along this journey. But the good news is, and again, word to the wise, when you guys are looking at Singer Featherweights, also known as the Singer 221 or a 222, if you're that fortunate to come across one of those, or a Singer 301, always check to see if your bobbin case is there. And if it is not, you want to adjust your bid or the maybe it's you're, you're buying this from somebody locally. Um, whether it's a bid or whether you're just negotiating a price, you want to consider that because that bobbin case is going to cost you if you don't have it. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll even do another video on that bobbin case. It's, I know it sounds a little nerdy to just do a video on a bobbin case, but bobbin cases are important. And uh, this machine is uh, it's like a Singer Featherweight, but on steroids. It's bigger, it's stronger, but it uses the same shuttle hook system and bobbin case that creates that incredible rotary style stitch that these uh, many of these older singers were known for. Thank you folks for watching. We got some sunlight today finally after a lot of cloudy days and I wanted to do a video and show off my uh, little ugly duckling here which uh, I, am, I am hopeful will become a swan or something approximate to that when we're done finally. Thanks for watching everyone.